Um, the original topic, I suppose, was, that was requested for me to discuss was uh, consequences of a, a big year. I changed the title of that to consequences of a wet year because in deference to those that are uh, actually still harvesting, I think a big year is uh, a bit of a misnomer for those. What happened in 2010? It rained and rained. Obviously, we were aware of that. If it had stopped there, it wouldn't have been too bad. But unfortunately, it, it rained some more and it's still raining. So I think uh, so long as the SOI stays positive and an Indian Ocean dipole is negative, it'll potentially keep raining, which is something we don't want. I never thought I'd say it, but I'm starting to be sick of the sound of rain on the roof. And we've seen this sort of um, scenario from New South Wales, our rainfall running through to uh, the end of January. You can see how wet it has been through the main cropping area. Uh, on my paper, you'll see rainfall for um, young, and you'll, you'll should notice that actually the growing season rainfall was um, not that much above average. So in terms of water use efficiency, particularly for the young area, we're um, stripping six tonne of wheat off, we're doing about 18 kilos per millimetre of growing season rainfall, which I thought was pretty good. So as I said, if the rain had stopped in mid-October, or the end of October, it would have been an excellent season. But unfortunately it didn't. So what, what happened? Uh, yields were up. Now we battled locusts, stripe rust, frost, waterlogging and floods, or should I say inundation, which is a new term for flooding. Uh, harvest was wire rope and, and snatch trap. So harvest was an absolute nightmare and it is still, it still is for some. I know uh, my trial cooperator is still trying to harvest Albus Lupins out the other side of Grenville uh, and headers were bogged there yesterday. Of note, I suppose, is uh, the technology that's available now. Uh, one of the, one of my the chaps that I do a bit of work with in the north up at Anambul, his response time was down to six minutes from the time he got the call to the time he could have the header out. So he was pretty proud of that. That was his record for the season. Yeah, also, he did hold the record for having headers bogged 26 times in one day, which he wasn't that pleased about. So quality was down. Uh, we know that. About 50% of the New South Wales harvest was uh, relegated to feed. Um, and we should understand that the other 50%, those growers that were fortunate enough to have crops that came in early before the rain, uh, actually did reasonably well. Returns were better. Um, I can remember the days, and I think Jim Bergonis said something about, you know you're old when you say, I remember the days. I can remember the days when feed wheat was about 60 or $80 a ton. Um, at the moment, feed wheat delivered noon dinner is 190 So quality was down, uh, but those, sort of, those prices certainly helped. And I've got the, the, just the tailing there, but I mean, we know it could have been better if we'd all stripped good quality wheat. Consequences of a wet year, and I'll talk about phosphorus, nitrogen, sulphur, and um, if Sue doesn't give you the gong, uh, all the others that are involved as well. So nitrogen, just briefly for nitrogen, because there has been some issues uh, that has been discussed today already. Uh, potentially nitrogen out the gate. Uh, good yielding canola crops, good yielding wheat crops, even though they feed wheat, there's still a lot of nitrogen goes out the gate and a lot of other nutrients as well and I'll talk about that. Uh, down the profile, particularly on the light soils and even the heavy soils in the north, uh, nitrate will move down through the profile with leaching. So it's nitrate, ammonium, an organic end doesn't move, it's that nitrate. Into the atmosphere, as soils remain waterlogged and warm, as they have done over summer in this environment in the north, you will lose nitrogen to the atmosphere as nitrous oxide and dinitrogen through the process of denitrification. So if, water, if soils, paddocks have remained waterlogged for two or three days, from then on you could potentially be losing four to five kilos of N a day. So deep end, have a bit of an idea of where your nitrogen is. So it's back to the future, segmented deep ends to see where the end bulge is, if there is one. Seeing some early deep ends coming back from the lighter uh, country north east of here, uh, and certainly the soil nitrates are extremely low in those soils. Consider the option of pre-plan or at-plan in in 2011. Uh, hopefully the rain will stop to give us an opportunity to do that. When we talk about nutrient removal, it's important to remember we haven't had a lot of nutrient removal over the last, uh, up until 2009 harvest. 2010 harvest has been entirely different. 2.4% nitrogen, 0.24% 2.24% phosphorus in the grain, 6 tonne of the hectare, and nearly 150 kilos of N goes straight out the gate. So you don't see that again. So effectively that, that is gone from the farming system. We're starting to grow more canola again, and so I suggest we'll see a lot more canola next year, or this year. 
when you look at the nutrient removal with canola, make no mistake, it is a hungry crop. It removes a lot of nutrient. So you need to take that into account when you're looking at your nutrient budgeting for this season. A bit of an idea of the range you'll see in nutrient removal. This is uh, sampled canola grain from some Grain, Al grain Arana Alliance trials. Uh, Ningen, Kerbin and Naramine. Uh, a range of different sulphur treatments uh, and untreated controls as a UTC. So you can see there's ranges of nitrogen, uh, 4.2, uh, 0.59 for P, 3.6 for N, 0.8 for P. So you can see significant amounts of phosphorus in particular are going out the gate. And another thing that you should take into consideration with canola in the rotation is the potential for significant amounts of zinc to be removed from those paddocks as well. So nutrient removal for the 2000 crop is significant based on the, on the 2010 crop harvest. The other way we can lose nutrients is through burning stubble. And burning stubble is the topic of the month at the moment simply because of the amount of stubble that's there already or there that's left over from the 2010 harvest. When you look at the nutrient in stubble and the amount that can be lost through burning, it is significant and it adds up to dollars. Apart from the fact that you're losing potentially half your carbon, you also need to take into account the potential for losing 40 to 50 kilos of N when you burn stubble. At current pricing, that might be 60 to $70 per hectare of nitrogen gone out the gate or into the atmosphere. So remember that when you're standing there with a the grower and saying it's too hard to work that, it's too hard to handle that stubble, let's burn it. If you've got seven tonne to the hectare of stubble plus, you'll be losing a lot of nutrition out of that system, gone forever. I'll talk about phosphorus now and I'll refer to some long term trial sites. Well they're not really long term, we've only had them going for a couple of years but potentially they're long term. One's at Rand in the Southern Riverina and other one's at Grenfell. So Rand, was, Rand, uh, sorry, Rand commenced in 2008. We had wheat, canola and wheat. So wheat was a dud, canola was pretty reasonable and wheat 2010 was pretty good. Grenfell, this was, sorry, this was a high soil pea site. Uh, 67 coal P at the commencement of the trial. Grenfell was a low P site, uh, 27 coal P at commencement of the trial. It's been going a bit longer. 2007 we started wheat, wheat, wheat. Same, similar rotation to a lot of growers around Grenfell during that period of drought. And then Albus lupins in 2010. Canola in 2009. Uh, just remember when I said we had 67 coal P on this site. You can see uh, error bars and, and all the sort of stuff we're supposed to have on graphs. No significant difference where we put 0, 10, 20, 30 and 40 of P. <coughs> now remember these plots are actually receiving 0, 10, 20, 30 of P every year over the same plot. So 2009 it had already received um, a previous, previous fertiliser application. So no significant difference. So even when we applied nil phosphorus at 67 coal P, the canola still yielded nearly two and a half tonne to the hectare. So no significant response to P with canola in 2009. Come 2010, it's a different story. This is that site. This is uh, Lincoln wheat sown on the 24th of May. It was sown dry and it rained the next day. Can anybody answer me when I ask the question, which of those plots has got phosphorus on it? All right, exactly right. So 67 coal will pee, remember. So this is after that crop of canola. Once again, clearly visual responses to sulphur at that trial site. When it came to harvest, and I'll, um, in the notes, there's just a slight correction. Um, on that graph there where we see ran 2010 Lincoln, we've had the um, soil test results statistically analysed, so you can see that there's a slight difference in that graph that I've got up and the graph you've got. So if we move from left to right, the coal P in the zero is now 55, the coal P in the 10 kilos of P is 65, 20 is 78, 30 is 82, and 40 is 86. So on the nil phosphorus site, remember this hasn't had, had phosphorus on it since we established the trial, we grew nearly four tonne of wheat. We added 10 kilos of pea. 
at 65 Colwell P and we increased our yield by over a tonne. When we went up to 30 kilos of P, we had a significant increase in yield over the 10 kilos of P and the control. So we need to remember when we're bringing canola back into the rotation, what effect it has on the following wheat crop in terms of nutrition availability. This isn't new sort of stuff. I talked to John Kierkegaard yesterday about a paper he presented in 2003 and we couldn't work out where it was, where he presented it, but it was titled Canola, a Hungry Crop. And that was in response to growers complaining about poor performance of wheat after canola. So when you've got canola in the rotation and you're looking at putting wheat into that paddock this year, look at your Colwell peas, and I wouldn't go any lower than 10 Colwell, sorry, I wouldn't go any lower than 10 kilos of pea, no matter what the phosphorus level was in that soil test. And it's interesting to note, when we look at soil testing around the Young District, 2008, 2009, 2010, we look at greater than 50 Colwell P in 2008, about 34% of the samples were over 50. When we look at 2010, there were only 22% of the samples over 50. So we have seen those paddocks that were tested actually were starting to see lower Colwell P levels than what you'd expect. Now this data could be skewed because it might mean that growers are actually testing more of those poor performing paddocks. But 50 Colwell P after canola isn't an adequate soil P level. As I said, canola is hungry and we should understand that. There's a lot of nutrient goes out the gate. To take advantage of the rotational benefits of canola, budget for additional P in the following cereal crop. So those sort of standards that you've been used to of wheat on wheat on wheat on wheat, when you're coming back in after canola in 2011, you need to make sure that you're putting adequate phosphorus rates into that cereal system. The other site at Grenfell is a low soil P site. Remember it was 26 Colwell P at establishment. It's been wheat on wheat on wheat on wheat and Albus Lupins in 2010. You can see at that site, as you'd expect, we've had significant responses to P up to 20, up to 20 kilos of P over that three year period. No crop there, reasonable crop in 08, reasonable crop in 2009. And actually 2009 wasn't a bad year in, in that area around Grenfell. And the water use efficiency on, those, on, those, on that trial was pretty ordinary. So there's that wheat on wheat on wheat effect, reducing the yield potential. And one of the particularly interesting things you'll note when you see phosphorus in graduated treatments through a trial is the effect it has on maturity. 40 kilos of P, nil P. Where you see those heads in those plots, those are the plots that have phosphorus. So when you put phosphorus into the system, you will allow your wheat or your, or your canola to express its true maturity. There was up to 14 days difference in terms of flowering in those plots depending on the phosphorus rate. Now, 2010, uh, Albus Lupins, Luxor variety sown in, in mid-May. Uh, the cooperator had actually sowed his paddock in mid-April, so we came in later. Just another little quiz. Can anybody tell me from that photo which is the plot that has phosphorus? That one. So that's the nil P. Now it wasn't my idea to sow lupins into that trial site. We just sow what the cooperator sows. And talking to blokes around Canamble and uh, Galaga Bone and Armour Tree, they grow a lot of Albus lupins up there and they don't use any phosphorus at all because they say that when they put phosphorus into their system sowing Albus lupins, it reduces the vigour. I thought that was a load of rubbish, but anyway. As it turns out, farmers actually do know a fair bit of information about their cropping system. One of the other things that we need to consider when we're growing Albus lupins and how we treat the seed in terms of how we dispose of it, and it's something that I learned last year, is Albus lupins is very effective in taking up manganese. So these are manganese levels in whole tissues taken from that site. 
Uh, that's 10,000 milligrams per kilo. If you're looking at uh, toxicity symptoms showing up in canola, for instance, you'd be looking at anything over 700 milligrams per kilo. And if you look at that, there's absolutely no signs of any manganese toxicity in those lupins. It's just a function of those albus lupins in particular, they take up manganese efficiently, even though there's not a lot of manganese in that soil. And obviously they'll transfer that manganese to the grain. And if you're feeding albus lupin grain to livestock, I'm not an animal nutritionist, but I'd suggest you get a nutrient analysis on it before you start doing that. If it's got high levels of manganese, it will actually be toxic. Pretty good crop, grew well, that's the outside. Unfortunately, uh, mid-September, we started to see a bit of phytophthora creeping into the, on the uh, eastern side of the trial in reps two and three. Come harvest time, well this wasn't even, pre-harvest, you notice that, the 30th of the 12th, really very interesting, and those, that, that Albus Lupin paddock was sort of lying down when it was green, started to stand up again, and if you split those pods open, the grain quality was excellent. Now this had had a lot of rain on it, and the growers in the north say that as well. The last thing they harvested in the armour tree turban area was their albus lupins and absolutely no problem with quality. And what happened there? Directly different to that previous curve from Rand at the high P site. So low P site here, with nil P, we grew four and a half tonne of albus lupins to the hectare. We had a significant decline in yield with the higher the phosphorus rate. Now don't ask me why, because I don't really know why yet. But certainly it uh, supports the anecdotal evidence from those growers in the north that suggests that you can get away with nil P on low P soils with albus lupins, and only albus lupins. They also suggest that there is some carryover benefit from the, for the following crop. So we'll be sowing wheat over the top of those plots this year and seeing if that has an effect. So what we're going to be looking at in 2011, our crop pea removal in 2010 will be high because I haven't done the nutrient analysis on those grain samples yet, but albus lupins could potentially have uh, 0 0.5 to 0 0.6, maybe even 0.7 percent pea. So at four and a half tonne to the hectare, there's a lot of peas going out the gate. So it'll be interesting to see the value of those, a value of a high yielding lupin crop in the rotation. And will there be an end response after a high yield and pulse crop? That's another issue that we need to consider because there's a lot of nitrogen's gone out the gate. So is it, is it any benefit to the following crop? Sulphur. Uh, sulphur is mobile and obviously sources can vary uh, from um, ammonium sulphate to gypsum. Soil S levels uh, in the top 10 centimetres are often low and that's because sulphur is a mobile nutrient so it often leaches down into the profile. So when you're testing for your canola paddocks for this year, do a 0 to 10, but when you're doing your deep ends, include sulphur in that and try and segment those, those canola paddocks as well. So you know where that sulphur lies. If it's down deep, you might need sulphur early. If it's up shallow, you won't need sulphur until maybe later on. So there's N and S demands interact especially in terms of quality. We know from earlier work from um, Tony Good and Peter Hocking back in the early 90s, that sulphur is really important for yield and oil, and oil production in canola. We should also understand that sulphur plays a role in grain protein formation, not necessarily grain protein. So if you've actually got grain, wheat grain, that has a, 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 a nitrogen sulphur ratio of greater than 17 to 1, the miller that you sell it to will have a lower mixing time and he will actually be able to grow bigger loads. So if you can market your grain with that advantage, you might be getting some more dollars for it. Now when we talk about sulphur, it's really interesting to see what we're seeing from trials in 2010 versus what we see what we saw in the 90s. When we look at these sites, Ningen, Kerbin, Narrow Mine, and there's another one, Wellington, that I haven't, haven't got up there, you can see the grain removal rate at the untreated control, 30 kilos of S and 15 kilos of S, and you can see even though these, these haven't been statistically analysed, 
There is no difference in terms of the sulphur content of the grain. That Ningen site in particular had very low soil sulphur levels. These other two sites, Kerbin and Narromine, you know, you think maybe we've got enough sulphur there. But this one at Kerb at, at, at Ningen is really interesting because if you looked at those soil tests pre-plant, it would indicate the sulphur response is highly likely. And yet there wasn't one. So we don't really know why either. Uh, and Laurie Street uh, from Grain Arana Alliance and I have actually gone back, we've soil sampled those plots again, we haven't got the analysis back. So there's something funny going on here in terms of the availability of S through the growing season to canola at these sites. So is it because we've got improved varieties, different varieties? Is it because we've, we've adopted a minimum till system where we're getting more mineralisation of S through the growing season? There's a whole lot of things that need to be considered. I haven't made the decision yet to say, don't put any sulphur out with canola, but it's just interesting to see how things can change over time. Uh, others, in 2011 we might consider, uh, remember crop removal nutrients have been high, so that includes your trace elements. And you saw those high zinc levels have gone out the gate up at Ningen. Significant amount of zinc out of that system. So boron, molybdenum and zinc, um, there's been a bit of bit of talk in 2009 and, and 2010 about trace elements and their importance in the rotation. The only literature I can find that suggests there's been a, a response to boron in, in rapeseed was in Canberra in the uh, late 70s. We know lime actually restricts the availability of, of, of boron because it actually attaches itself to the, to the lime. And you've really got to remember if you're considering any of these trace element applications, a little goes a long way. Boron is toxic at high rates. So if you're considering an application of boron, you're only looking at one to two kilos per hectare max. Any higher than that, and you could effectively sterilise that paddock for five to 10 years. It's a mobile nutrient, so applying it to the soil surface, rain will wash it down into the, into the sea zone. It actually is mineralised from the organic carbon as well, and it's available in wet soils and not so available in dry soils. So the last 10 years of dry soils, we've seen evidence of low boron. When those soils wet up, I'd suggest it's not as much of an issue. Canola tissues, 2000 to 2010, uh, 325 samples. If we look at the critical, we've, we've missed that axis off the side here, critical level for um, boron deficiency in canola tissues is about 22 milligrams per kilo. Uh, not many samples actually tested below that, you can see, but there's some actually some really bad numbers. That one was 3 milligrams per kilo of boron, for instance. So if you're starting to see those sorts of levels in your canola tissues, potentially, well not potentially, but there's every chance you should be seeing a response to boron. Zinc, another one that we see, and, and John Kierkegaard mentioned it in his paper, from, in his uh, GRDC paper in 2003, you're looking at very low levels of availability of zinc after liming and canola. This was a trial at June 8, 2003, significant responses to zinc. So canola, marginal levels of, of zinc, lime somewhere in the last couple of years, look at your zinc nutrition for your following cereal crop. Young, half in 2010, Half the soil samples received in the 0 to 10 were deficient in zinc. Molly, just to wrap it up, uh, pasture legumes, we know they need it. Pulse crops, in theory, cereals in Western Australia they're on their gutless sands, yes. Uh, very little response data, and once again, a little bit goes a long way. From our pasture experience, uh, 50 to 70 milligrams of so 50 to 70 grams of molybdenum will last you four to five years. Actually did a uh, survey in pasture paddocks in Western Districts of Victoria in 2006. Uh, from the application of molybdenum, just on a program basis every three to four years, those pasture paddocks were actually high in molybdenum in their tissues, and it was actually restricting copper uptake for grazing animals. So when you're thinking trace elements, a little bit goes a long way. 2011, manage those factors that have the potential to reduce returns. The weather is not one of the factors that can be managed. 
unfortunately. So as you're setting your system up for 2011, eliminate as much of those variables as you possibly can that you have control over and work with the weather. Thanks, sir. In regards to stubble management versus an availability, uh, to apply nitrogen within a min-till scenario or rely on stubble breakdown, standing stubble's benefits are probably in year two uh, due to tie-up mineralisation. Are there any instant benefits for the coming season, like this year? I suppose if, if you're leaving it standing and not incorporating it, you'll potentially get around the problem of immobilisation of that end. Uh, if you incorporate it close to sowing, you can eff effectively be looking at immobilisation, so limited availability of, of N until that organic N breaks down into nitrate N through microbial activity through the growing season. Uh, very interesting, talking to John Kirkyard yesterday, and anybody that um, saw Colin, Colin, Clive? Clive Kirky? Yeah. Uh, presentation at Wagga last year, and he also did an update on his paper at Ballarat this year. Uh, he's got some, I'd suggest, a, a real challenge to our paradigms when it comes to stubble treatments. Uh, he would suggest that it's actually, there's a role for N, P and S, in that stubble breakdown process rather than just nitrogen. Mate, just in that regards to that graph you put up regarding the end removal from burning stubble, do you make any comment about the amount of rain that stubble receives prior to the burning and how much of that recycles down? Yeah, well that, that, start, that sample was done in 2004, so we'd had a sort of reasonable bit of, bit of rain over summer on that paddock, and that was actually, I analysed that stubble, and those were the nutrient levels in that stubble. So if you're looking at a, at a fire greater than 300 degrees centigrade, which you will easily get in a paddock with a reasonable stubble load, that's the rate of loss you'll get. So you can, you can go out and grab a sample of stubble out of a paddock, send it away, and you'll get an analysis of the nutrient contained in that. I think you're mentioning critical P levels, coal P levels of 50. Jim, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Just so you look at me. Um, I think it was for canola, was it? 50... Ah, well, yeah, we, the canola, oh, that, that, the RAN site, we had 67 coal or pea, we didn't get a response to phosphorus. I'm just, I'm just interested in the relationship between critical pea levels, coal or pea levels, and a soils phosphate buffer index, so very yeah. from, that might have been a 50, yeah. that was down there compared to, say, 150. Yeah, no, all, all, type. all the PBIs in those, uh, those plots tested are, are less than 100. So I'm just wondering what effect that's going to have on, on critical P values in your the higher the, P, the higher the PBI, the more effect it's going to have. Yeah. I'm just wondering whether you had a rule of thumb for us, or is it, you know, is it a... No. Oh, I've got a feeling yeah. a critical yeah. P value of, of 40, personally, that a, that a PBI of, you know, around 40 might no, translate to something to 60 at a PBI of 150. I just want to know what... No, well, we still, we still look at the critical coal of P might be 40, but if your PBI, if PBI is over 200, uh, your critical level, you know, you should be putting more phosphorus on. And that's how we work the coal P and the PBI. So you say, okay, I've got a 40 coal P, ah, my PBI is um, 70, well, I'll put the recommended P rate on. But if you had a 40 coal P and a PBI of 200, you would put additional P on to take into account that PBI effect. Okay. So it might only be two or three kilos of P per tonne of target grain.